Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Sylvia Schneider-Fox. I'm a reproductive psychologist and a board member for Men Having Babies. And I am very excited to welcome you to the New York Men Having Babies Conference and to the 10th anniversary of the organization. It's only apt that we are launching this special weekend with the Advocacy and Research Forum. Because while over the years, Men Having Babies conferences have, of, of course, focused on providing guidance to prospective parents, they have also, at the same time, become a unique meeting place for all different stakeho uh, stakeholders in the field of surrogacy and gay parenting. These stakeholders, like many of you in the room tonight, have included parents, intended parents, uh, community activists, researchers, students, surrogates, surrogacy professionals, legislatures, uh, journalists, academicians, you name it. And over the years, uh, all these players in the field would come to us time and time again and say, men having babies conferences worldwide are the only time we all are in the same room and we are hungry to use the opportunity that we're together to collaborate, to have dialogue, to learn from each other, to share information. So it is in response to that very need that men having babies created the Advocacy and Research Forum. Um, it's called the International Advocacy and Research, Research Forums for Surrogacy and LGBT Parenting, but you can call it ARF. Um, since 2019, we've been holding ARF fo forums at and in conjunction with many of our major conferences worldwide from Brussels to San Francisco and uh, lots of other stops in between. These forums have become a town hall of sorts where we all meet to discuss the social, ethical, legal, empirical aspects of surrogacy and LGBT uh, parenting. And they have also become a platform where we can join forces on advocacy initiatives and where we can share best practices or recent research findings. This weekend, um, we want not only to celebrate our past 10 years, but also to turn our focus to the next 10 years. We want to look not only um, at just how we support gay men in forming their families through surrogacy, but also at how we support their families once they are formed. We want to understand why and how we build a strong and engaged community, and we want to discuss ways to make gay fatherhood a wider and more visible reality for all. And to tell you more about this weekend's uh, conversation tonight and tomorrow's uh, continuation, please welcome Ron Paul Diane, um, founder and executive director of Men Having Babies. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Tonight's program is different than the rest of our weekend uh, uh, as it is uh, in most of our conferences in the sense that this is not a prescriptive uh, guidance, guidance uh, session. This is not what uh, sometimes uh, people call the rest of our conference. This is not a boot camp. You're not uh, immersed into how and what and, um, and uh, contacts of uh, forming of families, but we take a look at the bigger picture. And for that, um, we want to do something a little different today. So we always include some, an element of research in the sense that we believe that uh, the way we form our families uh, has to be a process, a journey, where we feel comfortable, with which we feel comfortable, with which we can uh, be proud of, and one day our kids are going to be there when people ask us questions about a family, and we will be able, to, with confidence, to say, we did this in a mindful, 
considerate way. And we feel that in order to do that, and in order to be also able to talk to other people that may have some misconceptions as well as, um, you know, potentially legitimate questions about the way we form our families, we want to also be always mindful and interested in research. So we always have an element of research, you'll see even tonight, and as well as uh, an element of uh, talking about the, our positions, about our obstacles, our challenges, and opportunities to do things better. And the reason we have this advocacy forum specifically today, uh, and in general, is because we feel that what we do in the realm of education and uh, financial assistance, and you'll find out a lot more about that tomorrow, um, should be complemented with also removing some of the barriers, some of the challenges that exist for us to form our families. So those of you who were sitting here for a few minutes saw a slideshow of um, a variety of photos, you might not know, have, have noticed what the common denominator was, but it is people who took an initiative to do something regarding visibility or advocating, whether it is going to Albany to help lobby for the surrogacy reform that happened just like two, three years ago. Uh, it is uh, people who are volunteering at our conferences, people who have raised funds by plunging into the Atlantic Ocean in February, uh, people who have raised funds by running the marathon just this past weekend for us for the first time, uh, people who have podcasts, books, uh, blogs, uh, you name it. Those are all people who felt that they're part of a community, that what they've gone through and what uh, they feel other people might uh, be interested in doing as well um, is something that is something we, we share um, and something that we feel strongly about. So from these types of ad uh, advocacy, we're going to discuss tonight um, about the motivations of these people, about the uh, aim of their activism, about the reason they're doing it, and also about what we think in a more uh, structured way yeah, our, our organization can facilitate. So we're going to start with a panel about uh, a particular initiative that uh, two guys had to sue the city of New York for uh, fertility benefits. We're going to talk about how that is uh, in context of our legislative agenda and what we think could be done in order to make the process more affordable for New Yorkers and others, and how that is part of our what we call fertility equality or fertility equity platform. We're going to move to hear from a variety of these activists that you saw also on the screen uh, about their personal uh, experiences as people who are both part of the LGBT community and part of the parenting community and how they feel they fit in and do they fit in. And what are the needs of not just the um, uh, uh, prospective parents by way of creating the families, but also what are our challenges and how can we rise up as a community uh, to meet them as families. So really this is not the you know part of tomorrow's curriculum. There'll be some aspects of the ethical uh, uh, questions regarding surrogacy that we're going to tackle more systematically tomorrow at the Mindful Look at Surrogacy panel. Uh, there will be, of course, many, many other uh, topics that might be mentioned today that are going to be more systematically gone through tomorrow. But for tonight, this is about uh, a moment of reflection and possibly since this is our 10th anniversary of recalibration and we think that as an organization we might be, um, you know, possibly including through the feedback we get tonight, um, charting our way forward. Uh, in a broader mission, perhaps, than what we already had for the first decade. I also invite you to see the Then and Now exhibit outside, and thank you, Jan, our marketing person, and many other people who took um, uh, 
uh, you know, put a lot of effort into that. Um, we've gone a very long way uh, for the last decade, and um, and I, we think that with your uh, participation, we have uh, even better, um, going to have a better decade to come. So I invite Alan uh, Campbell here, our uh, advocacy and, and research associate, uh, to take us through the first panel. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Alan Campbell, and I am the Advocacy and Research Associate here at MHB. I'm thrilled to be with you tonight. I'm excited about what we're going to talk about with our guests here this evening. Um, a couple of notes, like Ron just mentioned, we've got two sessions tomorrow morning if you're interested. We're going to be kind of expanding and having a bit more of a roundtable discussion about the topics that we start talking about here tonight. So those are tomorrow morning. One is at 9.30, and the other is at 11. They'll be up on the... They'll be on this floor. Yes. Yep, they'll be on the opposite side of the building, just right back where you did your COVID testing. So we'll be there uh, to just share some experiences and talk about the community that we have created and that we can continue to build. So please feel free to join us if you feel like that is something that you want to partake in. We'd love to have you, and we're looking forward to that being a roundtable conversation. Um, we're very excited about the guests we have tonight. Um, I'm going to invite the first panel up, so Amelia, Corey, and Nicholas, please come on up. So first and foremost, we, we're just thrilled to have Corey Briskin and Nicholas Maggipinto here with us tonight to share about their personal experience. Ron mentioned what they're going through right now, and they're going to share a little bit about how they got there and why they've decided to make their case public. Um, I also wanted to note that both Nicholas and Corey are here with us in their personal capacities and that their views and uh, what they share tonight is personal and not reflective of anything related to their uh, current employers. We're also fortunate to have Amelia Demma here with us this evening. She's a member of the MHB Legal Advisory Committee. She's going to be on this portion of the panel to talk about the legal aspects of fertility equality. Amelia is a longtime patient advocate and was integral in the passage of the New York Child Parent Security Act, which legalized compensated security, uh, surrogacy here in New York. She's been working for over two decades to the benefit of those engaged in assisted family formation. She is a New York licensed attorney and previously worked for Resolve, the National Infertility Association on Legislative Matters. So this is our panel for the first session of our ARF tonight. We're gonna to talk a little bit first with Corey and Nicholas about their case and about their experience. And I'm gonna just open it up to them to share a little bit to talk about who they are, what their case is, so that you can have a little bit more of an understanding of what they're doing in the role of advocacy and activism related to their family building journey. So first and foremost, would you just tell us a little bit about yourselves, tell us about your situation, um, and what led up to you being here and what you're doing with your case? Sure, I'll start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Briskin. I am here with my husband, Nicholas Magipinto, and um, we are here because we have recently taken on not so recent anymore, but we've, we've taken on a, um, the initiative of, of bringing a, a charge of discrimination against my former employer, which is the city of New York. I was an assistant district attorney at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office uh, from 2017 through the beginning of this year. I'm no longer employed at the DA's office in Manhattan, although I am still uh, in, insured under the city insurance policy, um, which is an, um, a policy that covers city employees, not just at the DA's office, but uh, really across all city agencies. And, um, and that's significant because that, that is ultimately what, where we ran into to some trouble. When, when we um, wanted to start a family, uh, I'll back up even further than that. When we, when we were married in 2016, that was even before I, I began my work at the DA's office, we had begun exploring the possibility of having children through IVF and surrogacy, and we were excited when we were, were married and felt ready to, um, to move forward with that plan. We 
uh, unfortunately, our excitement was dashed by what we learned, which was that the policy, um, the, the, the plan that, that uh, the city insurance plan um, that, that uh, we were covered under did not cover any of the uh, IVF the, the, from beginning to end, the, 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 the process of, of IVF, which would be covered for, for others, and I'll, I'll let me kind of get into that in a little more detail in a moment, but um, that we would be excluded entirely from, from coverage. And uh, at, at the time, and frankly still, um, given the, the cost of, of IVF and surrogacy, we have been um, trying to, to, to build our family still through um, through IVF and, and surrogacy, but but uh, of course not able to avail ourselves of the of the, the benefits through the plan. So uh, I'll I'll turn it over to Nicholas to take off over from there. Uh, as Corey said, I'm Nicholas Majapinto. Uh, Corey is my husband, and um, the, the only thing I'll add to what he said is when we started this journey uh, in 2016, this was pre passage of um, a law that requires group health plans in New York to, to provide fertility coverage um, for anybody covered under that plan. And Amy, I'm sure we'll talk about that more. But um, when that happened, which I, I think might have been in 2018 or 19 maybe, um, that really sort of perked up my ears to the fact that if, if insurance companies or uh, employers weren't um, providing benefits equally to all, any, basically to anybody eligible, that was going to be a problem, a legal problem, um, and one that uh, I was quite frankly excited to take on uh, because I'm passionate about this stuff. Uh, Corey and I are both lawyers, um, and I think what primarily drove us here today, apart from the fact that we want to build a family, is that we think that this issue um, of equal access to IVF and other fertility services generally is, um, it, it's surprising that it's, it's taken this long for the issue to come to the fore. And uh, we found out in, in our own research and experiences with friends and others that the reason why it's taken this long is that people are intimidated by the system. They don't feel they have the resources or the knowledge. Um, and they also don't want to expose themselves publicly, which is all entirely understandable. And because we're in a position where um, Frankly, we know the system quite intimately, uh, and not that we have the resources, but we have friends who you know, help us, and we've now, we now have a legal team behind us. Um, I think we're very well positioned to um, you know, carry the, the, uh, the initiative forward and hopefully find success for the entire community. That's great, thank you. So you, you mentioned what the next question is gonna be. We know that litigation can be a form of activism. You know that well. So the question is, tell us about the decision to, like you said, expose yourself publicly to all of the things related to bringing this case in a way that is public. What led you to that decision? And what are some of your hopes on w when you started that process and decided to be so public about it? Sure. I'll just I'll start just by reframing the question a little bit, only because uh, the, the term litigation suggests that there is a current pending lawsuit, um, that, which there is not. At, as of now, we we are still at the stage where we're at the administrative stage where our our claim of discrimination, our charge, is being considered by the uh, the agency in, in Washington D.C. Um, that considers claims of discrimination against uh, employers, and, and in particular uh, municipal employers, in this case, the city of New York. So the, um, th that being said, it, it, it seems all but inevitable that we will uh, ultimately end up in, in a, a litigation, um, in litigation with the, with the city um, in, in some time. Uh, that time frame, however, is not entirely clear to us, but we, we hope that we can move along the, the, the process sooner rather than later. But to just one thing to be clear about, <clears throat> the reason why we're so confident in that is because, and I don't think this will be um, an uncommon experience for other people who might pursue this on their own. When we approach the city about this issue and ask them to address our concerns, right the wrongs that we brought to their attention, um, and frankly, just be fair, they said no. So we unfortunately don't have um, high hopes for the fact that this will resolve 
uh, in a way that's not going to provide a policy change as opposed to an individual solution for us. Right, and um, to, to sort of to re address the, the question as to uh, why, you know, why we decided to, to take the initiative and do this, um, I think that, you know, be, being that I was employed as, a, uh, as somebody who was protecting the community in which I worked in, in Manhattan as a, as a prosecutor, it felt, you know, when we were considering this, the situation that we found ourselves in, it just seemed really kind of backwards that as somebody who makes the, the sacrifices, particularly financial sacrifices of, of being a public servant, um, it, it seemed uh, particularly unfair that we would not be able to avail ourselves of, of this, this benefit of, of my employment. And I think that was, I can speak for myself, what, what motivated me most. And I also felt the, the situation that I was in made me feel confident that I could do this without fear of reprisal from my uh, employer. I mean, frankly, you know, by the time we really were, we, f we filed the charge, I was actually no longer employed at, at the, the, the city. That, that had nothing, that was a complete coincidence. I, I decided to leave not because of anything that was going on with, with the, the, the case, but, um, but it, it certainly helped in the sense that it created some distance, I think, between us and the city. Uh, and, and so, and as Nicholas kind of mentioned too, I, I feel like being that we're, we are both attorneys, although not attorneys who practice in this area at all, I'll leave that to you, um, we, we, we felt like we had this opportunity and we would be remiss if we did not, um, if we didn't take the initiative, so. To the question of um, just going public about it, uh, this was a strong consideration, and, and I remember saying to Corey, you know, are you prepared to do this? Frankly, I think I was asking myself that question too, and I wasn't. Um, and since we've done this, it's become um, much clearer to me why other people shy away from doing this sort of thing. Um, I can say that I think that it has, it has ca cast us in a light that has made um, some public association with us a little bit difficult um, for prospective employers, you know, other just just in ways that I, I, I certainly didn't anticipate. Um, we're kind of feeling the effects of that every day. We've we have handy Google alerts set up, and um, a lot of the right wing media likes to comment on our uh, on our situation without ever, of course, giving us a voice. Um, so. There are certainly considerations, but I don't regret uh, having pursued this at all. And I'll just add to that this was also part of a larger, so we, as Nicholas mentioned, we, we, we are represented by counsel. Our attorney's not, not here this evening, um, but that it is, uh, being that it's a, a, a firm that handles civil rights cases and, and does impact litigation uh, as uh, their core work, it, it, it became very clear to us that we were gonna be presented with this, this choice. So we, do, we, do we go public or, or do we keep this kind of under wraps? And, and it was suggested to us, and, and I, I certainly can now understand why, uh, for purposes of really bringing visibility to the issue, the, the importance of, of going public and, and, and really putting ourselves out there. And so while there are certainly drawbacks, which Nicholas just described in sort of the, the, the feedback that we've received, although even that said, we've gotten some great support as well. Um, but it, it um, was a sacrifice, I think, that was well worth making so that we could get some visibility around our, our issue. Thank you. We talked a little bit about your motivations and kind of the process of deciding to do this and then also deciding whether or not to do it so publicly. What advice or recommendation would you have for someone else that might find themselves in a similar situation based on what you know now? I would say um, if, if you're not in a position to be public or to, um, you know, to, to call out the injustice that you're experiencing, um, look for associations, um, organizations that will advocate for the cause, um, including even uh, 
um, attorneys and law firms that will, uh, that, that will consider representing classes of people that are in similar circumstances. For example, uh, in our case, um, I know that many people have, I, I should have mentioned this before, but sometimes the negative overpowers the positive. We've had so many people reach out in support of our cause, um, many of whom are also employees of the city of New York, and some of whom are actually employees of the city of New York that um, they're not gay men, um, but they had success in getting this coverage. And so uh, I know in our specific case, uh, we hope to have a class of former employees of the city of New York and their spouses um, who will pursue you know, our interests against the city. And I think in terms of private sector employers, that is going to be the, you know, that, that will be available to people too. Um, it's just a matter of banding together and um, finding an, either an, an advocacy organization or a law firm or something to represent your interests. And I'm more than happy to help organize that for anybody who's interested. Well, I'll, I'll just add that I, you know, on this particular issue, I'm hopeful that if we can get a, a, a positive outcome for ourselves, that will also result in a positive outcome for lots of other people whose employers are, are uh, offering a, a plan or a benefit that, that looks similar to the one that we had or have. Um, I, I'll also say this, I mean, when, if something doesn't like feel right and you, you, you kind of feel like you're in this position where you can either do something or not do something, the, obviously the easier choice is to just kind of decide to let it go and like somebody else will deal with it. But the thing is, is that nobody else is gonna deal with it because if everybody says that, then, it nev then no change happens. And so I feel like when, if there's a, an opportunity that arises on any issue that's important um, and an issue particularly that affects such a large group of people whose uh, voice has perhaps not been given the platform that, that it deserves, um, take that opportunity because I will say that I, I, I know this is gonna be a long road, but you know, you think of like Obergefell and like the, the, these, there are these people out there and uh, that, that have, have taken that initiative and really have brought about significant change for all of us and, and many of us in this room. So, uh, so I, I would strongly urge you to take the plunge. There are people that will, will help. There are lawyers out there who specialize in, in this type of thing uh, and we'll definitely, you'll be able to find the help you need. Last point I just wanna make is uh, the importance of just being informed generally. I didn't know this until relatively recently, shortly after we, um, when we were preparing the, the charge papers, so I guess that was in early 2022, um, and I don't know how many people here are residents of New York State or work in New York State, but ironically, New York State actually passed a law that I'm sure Amy can speak to that makes it unlawful to discriminate against anybody on the basis of sexual orientation in the administration of IVF benefits. Lo and behold, however, even municipal municipalities like the city of New York and many, many private employers are not following the law. So be informed, find out what your employer or your health plan is doing, why they say they won't cover, um, and really be empowered by that information. You'll be very surprised about how many people um, are in the same position as you and how together you really can um, hopefully try to make a positive change and, and ultimately make a positive change. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for sharing about your case. Like you said, you made a decision to be public about it, but you're continuing to do so by being here tonight, by sharing. A last question is, what's, I guess, a surprise positive that's come out of it? Maybe some support that you didn't expect or some opportunities to share the inequalities to to make it more known, what's something that was kind of a surprise? And Nicholas, you led me to this question. Like, what's something that was maybe a silver lining that you didn't expect that was anecdotally something you think is something worth sharing? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's just like the the referrals. The, the 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 you know, you talk to somebody about what is going on in your life, and you have this really significant thing, and people that you speak to get the sense that you're really passionate about it. And they, people genuinely want to help. I mean, we've been connected, I know, with, uh, with Amy uh, because of this, right, because of yeah. this uh, conference a couple of years ago. I mean, it's just the, the outpouring of support 
even setting aside all of the, the, the trolling and the negativity, there, there, are, there are people who genuinely do want to help and have resources to be able to help. And, and so I would say that the silver lining for me is just to know that there is, this, there is a silver of humanity out there that, that really um, can be very meaningful when you're going through it. So, For me, it would, be the, um, it would be the support among straight allies. The number of people who are not directly affected by this um, or who maybe are affected because they've gone through IVF themselves and realize how disenfranchising it is to just categorically exclude gay men or single men um, in this way, and, and how really they lend their voice, their voice of support in the workplace um, to, to advocate you know, for the cause. I've had people reach out on LinkedIn and say, you know, we saw your article in whatever publication and you know, I'm going to you know, the board of my company and finding out what we're doing about this. Um, it's, that to me is really empowering because it shows me that this is definitely a human issue and not just an issue that affects gay men. Thank you so much. Thank you for not only being, being here tonight, thank you for being activists, thank you for sharing your story, thank you for being willing to sit in front of people and continue to talk about it as it's pending and as you mentioned there's some things that are not so positive that you're experiencing so thank you for in spite of all that, still continuing to, to be here and be present. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks for continuing to pave the way for other people. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the New York IVF mandate and the Child Parent Security Act. We're gonna have Amelia talk to us a little bit about those things, what's happening in New York State, what could happen in New York State, um, what the situation might look like one day, and what is it gonna take to get there in forms of ag activism and advocacy. I have one request. Can I stand up? Absolutely. You want to move down? Do I have to take this off? Turn it off. I'll be yeah. done. Okay, thanks. Am I off here? Yeah? Okay, great. I'm Italian. Talking without my hands is hard enough. Talking sitting down is just not happening. So one of the things that, um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for all of your energy and your courage and your commitment. Um, I applaud you and I'm grateful um, to be here with you. Um, I am also the mom of IVF twins, so that got left off of my bio, and I think that's one of the most compelling things for you to understand. Most of the colleagues, most of my colleagues that you will meet over the next couple of days here at the conference, most of us have also traveled our own journey uh, with challenges to family building. Um, because I was eventually blessed, I have 27-year-old IVF twins. I dedicated my professional life to doing this work. I started working for Resolve the National Infertility Association 21 years ago, working on a federal mandate for IVF insurance. 21 years later, we do not have a federal mandate for IVF insurance. Every year we go to Capitol Hill, we will continue to go to Capitol Hill, we will not stop fighting for that. What are we doing more locally here? Um, well, actually, let me give you a little bit of history. When I started working on a federal mandate for IVF, the issue was that insurance companies did not recognize that infertility is, for some of us, for me, for my mother, for my daughter, a medical condition. The insurance perspective was, you don't die if you don't have a baby, so we're not gonna cover you for your treatments. There's no medical necessity for you to be pursuing this. It's elective. If you want to do this, it's out of your own pocket. We worked hard to change the definition of infertility to include medical necessity. Well, guess where that landed us? So straight people got coverage. You all, for most of you, I'm presuming, there is no medical necessity. You're here for reasons other than you're not here because of an illness or an infertility uh, condition. Uh, you're just simply here because you are not uh, able to uh, pursue conception, gestation, and delivery without assistance. Uh, and so what we worked so hard to achieve now has set a significant hurdle for us. So what we are doing and what I invite each of you to do, litigation is a route. It involves all of what these gentlemen have explained to you, time, resources, courage, uh, opportunity, you also can advocate in a different way, and you can join the team that Men Having Babies is putting together, myself, New York Attorneys for Assisted Family Formation, NIAF, you'll hear a lot about NIAF this week. We are intending to return to Albany 
thank our lawmakers for a New York IVF mandate, and then say to them, but we have continued work to do. And that's where all of you can be way more effective than I can be. I can go to Albany and I can tell your stories. I can ask lawmakers to sit down and listen to me about what needs to be changed with the current New York IVF mandate. By the way, that IVF mandate came into play, uh, or came into law, I should say, uh, just in 2020. So it is relatively new that New York State said to its insurers, if you sell insurance in the state of New York, you have to provide coverage, but you only have to provide coverage for those who have demonstrated or documented medical necessity. So we are going back to Albany, and I urge you to join us. I don't invite you to join us. I urge you to join us. Come with us. Tell your stories. Lawmakers want to hear how they should be legislating for you. Are we going to be successful in this legislative session? I doubt it. It took us eight years to get the Child Parent Security Act passed, but we were relentless and we went every year. Ron was with us. A good number of my colleagues in this room were with us. Um, we went as volunteers. We went on our own dime, on our own time. But we were relentless and we pushed and we pushed and we pursued. Yes, there are things about the Child Parent Security Act that are not perfect. That's the law that has legalized compensated surrogacy in the state of New York. Yes, we are going to continue to address the Child Parent Security Act. But yes, we must address the inconsistency with this comprehensive piece of legislation that says you can do compensated surrogacy in New York. We have a New York IVF mandate that says Insurers should or will cover IVF, but you all are caught, caught in the loophole. You all are caught in the underrepresented in the legislation. And we can change that. We will change that. I am confident that we will find lawmakers. Our lawmakers, the, the, the lawmakers who were with us all along the way in the eight years for the Child Parent Security Act are passionate about assisted family formation legislation. Many of them have had their own infertility issues as well. So you will not be speaking to deaf ears. You will be speaking to lawmakers who want to bring this legislation to the floor and get our policymakers to understand that we need to broaden the definition of infertility, take out that medical necessity, understand that there are New Yorkers who want to be parents who don't fit in this very, very tight uh, definition, uh, and hopefully make progress. Uh, if you have any questions at all about how you can be involved, you can be involved virtually. If you call my office, I'll give you a list of numbers to call. I'll give you a list of emails to, to send to. But what I really want to do is see as many of you join us in person in Albany, knocking on the doors of our legislators. They work for us. It is an intimidating process to pursue advocacy until there is that flip of the switch and you realize I am empowered, I have a voice, I demand to be heard, and I can affect change. And that is my message to you about where we are with assisted family uh, building um, law here in New York, and by the way, on the federal level. So through Men Having Babies, you'll be invited to participate in our virtual advocacy day uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, there are seven or eight pieces of legislation uh, that we lobby every year, and it, we fail on most of it. We go back every year. But more than that, get active locally. Um, find out who your very, very local representatives are. Go make an appointment with them. So I heard these folks speak at the Men Having Babies Conference, and I'm outraged that the New York legislature passed a New York IVF mandate that doesn't include me. Uh, and be heard. Um, men Having Babies will give you um, a script if you're uncomfortable um, just sort of speaking off the cuff. They will give you a list of the issues to address. They will give you the um, support that you need. My team that is joining with Men Having Babies, the NIAF team, we are available. We are attorneys who do this work. Oh, and by the way, I do want to mention, most of the attorneys who do assisted reproductive technology do not litigate. We are not in the business of litigating. We are in the business of helping families come to be. We work collaboratively. We work in a celebratory way. Our judges embrace us. Most of the time when I go into court, different from what these guys are going to face, 
when I'm asking a judge to assign parentage, as all of you at some point will do, you will ask a court to establish your legal parentage. Often when I do that, I find the judge who's choked up or a judge who's got a tear streaming because there is pride and there is joy. So there is momentum here. We've got to get through that wall of why not coverage for everybody who wants uh, uh, to parent. When you're meeting with your medical uh, advisors, when you're meeting with your fertility clinics, remember something. Those fertility clinics, their profit comes from us, the patients who are paying their fees. They are stakeholders in getting this legislation fixed so that you all have coverage. Ask your doctors, ask your nurses, ask the social workers, are you active? Do you have a voice in helping to expand the IVF mandate? And it, 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 it suggests to them that you're in this business, so you're almost compelled to speak on my behalf, the patient's community. So bring that message to your doctors, bring that message to whomever it is that you're engaging in your assisted family building, but most importantly, bring that message to our lawmakers. Yes, good. You're welcome. Thank you so much for all of the information and again, for sharing what's happening here, what we can do um, to go a little bit further about our advocacy efforts. Um, this issue we consider here at Men Having Babies to be fertility equality. We're working hard to eliminate, reduce the barriers that gay men continue to face in forming their families. The issue here is no longer access. The Child Parent Security Act made it possible to access compensated sur surrogacy. What we're now facing are financial barriers and we're continuing to fight. As Amelia mentioned, please reach out to us. You'll be, you'll be asked to engage with us for our advocacy efforts and I would encourage you and urge you to engage with us and continue to fight for not only yourselves but everyone else that's in this room and those that aren't here with us tonight. Let's continue to recognize our own class of people and continue to fight for ourselves. Um, because I think as Corey mentioned, no one else is going to. We have to be our own advocates so we can see change that we deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, again, continuing to be public about what you're doing. Amelia, thank you for your expertise and for your passion. Thank you for the hard work that you have been doing and that you continue to do on our behalf. We are in awe of you, we're proud of you, and we thank you. So from all of us here, let's give them a round of applause for being here tonight. And we'll move on to our next panel, um, led by Ron and some of our other members of the community.